The lady says it's recording. Here we are on the blind man in black. I'm Brian Snyder. Thank you for watching on YouTube and listening on Apple podcast. Uh, also, if you like my wife and I being totally exhausting, go to the exhausting Snyders on TikTok, and we are going to be starting an exhausting Snyders podcast soon. So keep an eye and an ear out for that. And I'm so excited because I'm here with hairstylist, actor, playwright, photographer, translator, and dear friend, Edward Teddy Matthews. And I, and I Teddy Matthews, let's just go with Teddy. Sure, only the bank and the government call me Edward, so. Okay, me yeah, yeah, I it just slipped out, I don't know why. <laughs> no worries, it is, it is my legal name after all, so. And, and you're a writer, so we'll talk about all of that. So, um, sure. Thank you so much for being here, and um, I, I'm, I'm honored. So how how you been holding together through this pandemic? Uh, you know, one day at a time, I suppose. It's uh, like the TV know, show. A, yeah, yes. Being a, <laughs> being a hairstylist, it was not not the easiest uh, sort of transition to make. I, I I actually, as you as you know, I spent a good amount of time uh, living in Japan, and so actually mm -hmm. at the beginning of 2020, I sort of was looking at opportunities to go back and possibly mm -hmm. live there again. So I was there when sort of the proverbial s hit the fan shall we say in in uh, in and so that sort of prompted me to come back to the states but it's been great since and i've been really glad uh i mean aside from all the you know illness and dead people uh it, it's actually turned out sort of well for me in in, in some respects because i'm glad to be back in los angeles with you know some of my closest friends and family and, and so, so did, did you go to japan and then go to brooklyn so basically, right after CalArts, I, um, for those of you who don't know, Brian and I went to CalArts together. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, right after CalArts, I decided to go live in Japan. And I lived there the first time for about five and a half years. And then I came back to the States for about three years. And then I went back again for another two years until uh, the earthquake and tsunami, which was, uh, which sort of got me back to the States again. Um, and then okay so i thought you were talking about when, the, when the shit hit the fan i thought you were talking about the pandemic oh yeah so, yeah no no yes exactly yeah i did yeah. i went from tokyo then back to new york because that's where i was living previously with my father so okay okay so um we're gonna we're gonna talk about a lot of stuff and i'm really excited so let's start at the very beginning where are you from originally i'm born in oakland so northern california mm -hmm. um but moved to southern california from my father is an actor and so we moved to southern california I guess when I was about um, eight or nine, or no, it's no like eleven or twelve, I think. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about your father because he is. I mean, in my mind, he's famous. Like I've I've seen him everywhere, sure. and and uh, is I mean, you know, one of the things that I remember him. Mean, he was in the Muse with Albert Brooks, but I know he's been in yes. almost everything. Well. I, I maybe not almost everything, but he is he's one of those kind of actors that if if you know the theater world, then you probably have heard of him. If you don't know the theater world, then he's that guy that you've seen in in those things, that guy from that thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so uh, his name is is Dakin Matthews, correct? Dakin Matthews. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was uh, I remember we like didn't we play cards together with him once like in some in, like that a sounds theater. right. I think I think we yeah yeah at uh, at my dad North he used to have a theater in North Hollywood yeah and so then in like the green room I think we had like a poker night or something in there. So. Yeah yeah I remember that very well. I think I lost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I didn't win. I rarely do so. <laughs> <laughs> so so how was it growing up? But so what did what did your mom do? Uh, so my mother also was an actor. So she actually was also, she was part of Juilliard's group one, which is mm. the first class, the uh, the first drama class out of uh, Juilliard. So she was in the same class as Kevin Klein and Patti LuPone and that whole sort of And one of entity. our professors from CalArts, right? And Mary Lee Rosado, that's right. Yes. Right. And Mary John as well, Mary John Negro as well. Right. Um, so that you know they my parents actually met prior to her being accepted to that program so they moved back to new york together um and my father actually ended up teaching i believe history of world theater at juilliard at the same time that she was there because he was a, an english professor i see um and then went on because of after they finished the program they they sort of formed john hausman's acting company which was a touring company 
Um, and because other members of the class had to leave for a variety of reasons, they actually invited my father to come in. So he was an honorary member of the, the first uh, John Houseman acting company. That they did, did you meet John Houseman? I believe I have. I don't. I. I. I don't. I don't remember it to be perfectly honest. But I believe I have. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know who John Houseman, he's a very famous actor. But I. It's funny because in the like late eighties, early nineties, I remember. Uh, he had there was a commercial that I don't. I feel like it was like American and Express or something. I, yeah. But, it, but yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He he would do this thing. He go, we make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. <laughs> exactly. I think but he, he said everything in, he in about that same candor. So <laughs> yeah, he he played uh, like uh, I think it was uh, the grandfather of Ricky Schroeder and Silver Spoons, right? I think so. That sounds yeah. right. I I can't don't don't put me on the record for this one, but I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So what was it like growing up with parents in the theater? What was, what was that I experience? mean, this is a question that gets asked me all the time. And given that I don't have sort of an alternative childhood to reference, I don't really, I don't have a, I don't know mm -hmm. uh, how to, how to reflect on it differently. But I mean, I think that I'm the youngest of four kids. Um, my eldest brother was severely mentally handicapped and actually passed away last year. Oh, Jesus. Um, I am so sorry. So, oh, that's all right. So, um, so, but he, you know, he wasn't always, especially me being the youngest, he wasn't always in the home with us all the time. He was so, you know, he had such a condition that he did have to be sort of in foster care and taken care of 24 seven or else my parents probably wouldn't have been able to have any sort of a career whatsoever. Was um, he, uh, so did he have intellectual disabilities or uh, cognitive? He was both um, autist, severely autistic and mentally and physically handicapped. So he had, and then, you know, as, as his deterioration went on, you know, he ended up becoming bedridden and, and couldn't, and had to be fed from a feeding tube, which essentially stole from him the one thing in his life that he adored, which was eating. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, in many ways, his, he was, he was in bad shape and his passing is, is a blessing in some ways, but what I was leading to with that was that, you know, being the youngest, my sister and my brother and I all about two years apart, um, and Richard was the eldest and he was two years older than my sister, uh, we all grew up essentially backstage. So mm -hmm. from about three years on, when I was about three years old onwards, my parents, uh, I don't know if they were joint or if they worked together, but they, my father I know was the creative director of, at the time it was the Berkeley Shakespeare Festival, which is now known as the California Shakespeare Festival. It's in Orinda now. Mm -hmm used to be at John Hinkle Park in Berkeley. And I mean, I grew up basically backstage doing homework there all the weekends we were there, hanging out with all the actors backstage in a very sort of bohemian, wild, mm -hmm. you know, upbringing. I was in, um, in fact, that was the first job that I was ever fired from at three years old. Really? What I happened? Was in, <laughs> I was in uh, Romeo and Juliet starring Annette Benning as Juliet. Okay. And, uh, I had a scene, I had very small scenes, you know, they didn't want to obviously tax a three year old with too much. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the thing that, that got me the axe was uh, uh, during the sort of Juliet's morning scene after they, they discover her, you know, dead, quote, dead body. And then mm -hmm. sort of the morning I was sitting on my father's shoulders and supposed to be sad. And I guess the, the thrill of the audience, I couldn't take mm -hmm. it. And I, you know, put my hands to my ears and stuck my tongue out and did sort of the classic clownish gesture to the audience, which of course burst into uproarious laughter. And uh, so I was fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, did that affect your confidence or? <laughs> well, <laughs> as my aunt tells it, I don't remember it that clearly, but as my aunt tells it, she came to pick me up uh, from the theater and I got into the back of the car and I said, Berkeley shakes, Berkeley shakes, who cares about Berkeley shakes? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I clearly was not that bothered at the time. Okay. I guess not, since you wrote a song about it, a defiant mm. song. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Thankfully, my father did give me opportunities to come back to the theater in the future. So right. right. <laughs> wow. So, uh, so you remember Annette Benning? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I mean, she's remained a pretty close family friend, so she comes okay. around every once in a while. You know. It's funny. I, uh, I, I had the same, uh, vocal teacher as her niece, Ashley. Oh, really? Do you know Ashley? 
I don't. Yeah, I've, I've pretty much I've I've met Annette's children, I think, mm. or child once, um, and then but when they were very young, and okay. then uh, and then but I've never met Warren or the rest of the family. Okay, all right. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So, so what happened? Like, what, what was it? So what happened after that, uh, after you got fired? Uh, I mean, if I can remember, I mean, obviously I was young and mm -hmm. Andrew and Andrew's my older brother and Annie is my eldest, my eldest sister. Mm -hmm. And they continued, they had parts in the show too. They were older and, and a little bit more mature. So they continued to do the show. Uh, and, you know, my family always sort of carved out opportunities for us to participate. My father regularly, uh, at ACT in San Francisco, he played Scrooge for many years during their production of A Christmas Carol mm -hmm. and had opportunities for, I, I was too young at the time, but had opportunities for both my sister and my brother to, to appear in that and, uh, and so on. And then as far as returning to the stage, it wasn't until I was in about fifth grade, I think, when uh, my parents then became the artistic directors of, uh, at the time it was called Vita. I don't know if it still exists, Valley Institute of Theater Arts. It was in like Saratoga, but okay. we did a touring company where we started in Saratoga and then we went to a place called Benbow Lake, I think in Central California, and then finished it out at a, a beautiful place called Sand Harbor in Lake Tahoe. That's like a big sort of natural amphitheater made of sand on the coast of, of the lake. So wow. that, that remains a pretty awesome childhood experience to be, you know, a part of a, of a touring theater company at, I don't know, well, 10 years old or something. So there wasn't any sense of like, ah, I don't get to see my friends or like, you know how, like I moved around a lot when I was young and I, sure. you know, had to go from, and I lost a lot of friends because I'd go to a school and I'd make a friend and I have to move again. So was there any of that or was it like you were you everybody was contained to the touring group i think because of sort of the excitement of it and also being you know a member of a of a family with other siblings it's kind of like you know the siblings definitely can sort of fill that i guess that friendship need in in that go but you know if i really think about it I guess we did prior to that because my my mother actually ended up going to Stanford for um she was going to go for a PhD in drama but she ended up finishing out with just a master's but we ended up living on campus there so I moved there when I was in fourth grade and then I moved to a different school when I was in fifth grade and then I moved to a different school when I was in sixth grade because we moved to Los Angeles so I mean I didn't really have a lot of opportunities to make friends in that time probably outside of my immediate family. I mean, mm. if there's anyone watching who was a friend of mine at that time, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have, I mean, I think definitely once we relocated to LA, we had, I had more of an opportunity to begin to develop friendships, but also growing up as a young, you know, gay boy in the late eighties, early nineties, I didn't, I felt definitely much more connected to my family and the safety that that provided than and, and I guess friends at school. There were, I didn't have a whole lot of friends at school. Mm -hmm. Now, um, now I, I always viewed you. You know, when we went to Cal Arts, I always felt like you were uh, are uh, highly intelligent, one of the most intelligent people that were wow. in that class. And not, <laughs> well, not to not to not, not to especially considering I started when I was seventeen. But <laughs> yeah, not to diminish anybody in our class, but or their intelligence. But um, and I probably just did by saying that, but. Um, I just felt like your reading ability, your cold reading was just, you know, amazing. And like, so did you feel like, because I'm, I'm bringing myself up again, when I moved around, like it was very difficult for me in, to stay connected to school and like make any progress because I was always mm -hmm. behind, you know, and I, I feel mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that wasn't an issue for you, was it? Um, I would say academically, it wasn't always great. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I mentioned it before, my father is an English professor. So yeah. we grew up kind of, you know, if you ever said anything incorrectly, you were being corrected with most haste. So, <laughs> so was I that annoying was that. or was it, uh, what did you appreciate I guess, it? But you know, it's also, again, I did, I didn't have, you know, sort of anything else to compare it to, but mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thankful for it in many ways. Mm -hmm. I am a bit of a, of a grammar Nazi now, but you know, mm -hmm. I, I love the English language. What can I say? Yeah. Um, you, I mean, I could, I could sense that, you know, when we worked together, I could tell that you loved words and you, you were, like I said, you were an amazing cold reader, which is a skill. Oh, I mean, you. it's, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
it's difficult. And, and I always felt like you had, you definitely had mastery of the English language for sure. It's uh, at, at the, at the expense of mathematics, perhaps, because mm. that is definitely not, <laughs> not yeah. a skill that I possess. So. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm shitty both in math and English. So it's, it's, it's all bad for me, but uh, <laughs> well, come now. <laughs> <laughs> you make up for it in other ways, I'm sure, Brian. Oh, thank, thank you. I, I, I try to be a loving person, but I fail often. Mm -hmm. But I'll uh, and an yeah. entertaining uh, podcast host at that. So, oh well, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> that's that's what I'm going for. So, when did you come out? Like, did you know early on? Um, I would say that I knew pretty sure uh, early into my freshman year of high school. I didn't, and then and then it becomes one of those things where once you you know. Once you sort of have the realization, then you can look back at the rest of your life and be like, oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, it was mm. kind of always there in a situation. It's just, you know, I I am, I guess what they refer to as a gold star in the sense that I don't, you know, I, I am gay through and through, I suppose. I've never had a, an, a relationship or an experience with a woman, so. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, you know, I just, just, I just, that's what the universe has, has dictated to me. So let me ask you this. Did you all, when you came out, did you feel comfortable? Did you feel scared? What were some of the emotions? Oh, there? absolutely not. I mean, it's definitely, I mean, there's a lot of fear. I, I am, my, my coming out story is, is, is an interesting one because I, it was not my choice, but I am very thankful for the way that things went down, shall we say. I discovered you know, sort of certain urges or, or sexuality about myself. And I went, I actually went up to San Francisco with my sister to visit her boyfriend at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure my mother sent me along to make sure that, you know, to keep an eye on her. Mm -hmm. But of course, as soon as I arrived, they were like, get out of the house. We, we want to <laughs> <laughs> so he, there was so a they mall threw you out? The like, we're, we're well, they had, there was a mall across the street from his apartment and they were like, go hang out at the mall. And I, I mean, I was glad. Oh, it wasn't a permanent thing. It wasn't like you need to find other lodging. No, 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 no. I oh, could, no. you know, but it was just like, you know, they did. They, it's two, you know, 18, 19 year old kids. They don't want to hang out with their. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, in in the process of being left alone in the mall for long periods of time, I found myself uh, stealing adult magazines from the bookstore, including a Playgirl magazine, which I thought, I mean, you the, the vibrations that was sent through my body looking at something like that was just astonishing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, I felt a huge sense of weirdness and guilt and strange. And why would I look at this? And and this is in the process of of sort of my discovery. This is this is kind of how I came to this realization. Mm -hmm. And so then, of course, I threw it out. I threw it out down the garbage disposal, and I was like, "Weird. Well, whew, glad I got that out of my system." Mm -hmm. Next day, I went back to the mall and stole a book called "The Joy of Gay Sex." So it was it was while flipping through this book that I sort of had the realization, why would you steal a book called The Joy of Gay Sex unless you were really interested in it or gay? Mm -hmm. And so then I took this, I took this book back with me and I started keeping a journal um, about my feelings and about what this meant to me. And, you know, and a lot of the emotions that I expressed in it were shame or fear or what is my family going to think? And, you know, all, all of those normal I guess normal, you would say, or up, up for the time sort of emotions. And um, then my brother found it in my room and he uh. he told my sister, he said he was looking for scissors. I don't know why you'd look for scissors in a locked briefcase underneath my bed, but he was looking for scissors. That sounds like bullshit. He, yeah, well, yeah, well, you know, but again, I'm thankful mm -hmm. for it, to be perfectly honest, because mm -hmm. He ended up then telling my sister and then my sister ended up telling my mother out of genuine concern. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and so then I remember I was trying to go to sleep and, you know, my sister came into my bedroom and she was like, mom wants to talk to you. And it was like, what? She's like, mom wants to talk to you. And I was like, what, what, what? <laughs> and I went and my father was out of town work with work at the time. And I went into the room and I just knew immediately what the situation was. I could just oh, really? Tell from the way that she was sitting in the bed with her blanket pulled up, you know, and her hands resting on top of the blanket with a with a, a look of utter concern painting her face. And I just knew that this was that this was the time for the conversation. And I just ran away and I ran into my bedroom and I was like, I don't want to do it. Not now, not now, not now. Mm -hmm. 
but you know they came in and each of them you know each of my family members came visiting me like a like a like an invalid in bed or something each one offering their you know offering their gifts or something afterwards and um and it was fine you know i feel really lucky i mean you know years went by again before we talked about it with before i talked about it again with my mom and then even years further before i ever eventually talked about it with my father but he knew you know and these kinds of things and knowing that there was that level of acceptance there was something that and knowing that i didn't have that i wasn't living this life of hiding it for so long because i don't know how long i would have gone on. i have no idea how long i would have gone on hiding this mm -hmm. if this hadn't if i hadn't been outed in this way and so how, you know, how i'm sorry how old were you when your brother like 13 i guess 13 okay. probably all right um so i you know this is one of those things where people would be like wow that's messed up your brother outed you but i actually am very thankful because mm. it helped me start to develop a strong gay identity from a really young age and feel confident about it and so i'm you know i don't know how things would have been different if i if i hadn't been outed in that way so so when did you publicly come out though it was pretty i would say it was pretty well known i i i actually came out to friends at at school at 13 to, yeah prior to the family oh all right. I knew so that, how did that I go knew that this was happening well we i went to a really a catholic private catholic high school in burbank and we had what we at the time we had something called a peer support room which was basically you could get um a, a hall pass to skip a class and call one other person to go to this room and you could have essentially like a, a peer support. And so I was friendly with this girl in my class. I'm not gonna name any names, but you know, she was not, you know, she wasn't popular or anything like that. We weren't like close friends, mm -hmm. but I felt that I could trust her and I felt like she would, that she was a, a willing set of ears to listen to my problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also, you know, she was pretty, uh strong in her in her catholic faith too which i almost sort of wanted to get i guess an, an angle on because i grew up catholic mm -hmm. um and so you know we sat in the room and and i cried and i and i expressed my feelings to her and she was very supportive and and that helped i think if i remember correctly that i came out to friends at school first i think mm -hmm. i can't i can't be sure it was a long time ago but then I mean it became pretty clear I think to most people around me I don't partic I don't fancy myself as particularly flamboyant but then I you know every time I've told someone I'm gay they pretty much tell me oh yeah I knew that already mm. so <laughs> so, mm. so uh it's never it's never been much of a I guess much of a struggle I think there's because it, it happened I I sort of was outed and and had to address it in a in a mental way and in an emotional way from such an early age i i don't really have i don't know yeah it's, i don't know how to put it it's, hmm. I, it it hasn't been that much of a struggle for me i mean i will say you know when it first when i first started having these feelings it wasn't you didn't have i didn't have a whole lot of confidence in them you think to yourself hmm. why am i having this if you know especially because when you are a young homosexual, shall I say, or bisexual, or someone who has feelings towards the same gender, um, it doesn't mean that you have feelings towards other homosexuals. You just have feelings towards the same gender. Yeah. yeah. So it's very hard to be in a world where you are surrounded by people who you find attractive and knowing that they can't, that that's not something that, that ever, sort of can ever be. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the struggles. And that's where I think like, you know, when I was young, I would think things to myself, like if only if only I'd been born a girl, life would be so much easier, boys would be interested in me and things like that. Obviously, I don't feel that way now. Right. Was there a t was there ever a time that you thought about transitioning? No, no, I don't think so. I think it's, you know, and I'm, you know, no grudges or anything I, mm -hmm. and, and no judgment on anyone who does. It's just mm -hmm. that wasn't a part of my of my coming of age, I suppose. Yeah. Was, you know. yeah. I think also because, you know, the sort of saying to myself that if I were only born a girl, it would have been much easier was not so much a representation of what I wanted for myself so much as kind of that that would be the easy means for boys to like me, basically. 
that then at least boys would like me. But ultimately, I mean, the you know, I mean, not to get into sort of the nitty gritty of of uh, of sexual fantasy, but you know, I mean, what I find attractive is men together. So that's why I think the idea of sort of transitioning or of I don't identify as trans in that way because I because I find the idea of two men together to be the to be sort of my desire, I suppose. I understand. Um, so uh, when did you have your first boyfriend? Not until CalArts. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Just because so I've, I, they, I mean, there were opportunities in high school, I guess, but it was always ter it was always terrifying to me, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest. The, the, the actual notion of engaging was terrifying. And it's also loaded with a lot of other things, too. I mean, there's a lot of social elements that, you know what I mean? I think that this is a somewhat of a, can, I don't want to say confession, but I think because I think a lot of other people probably growing up in the era that I grew up in feel the same way, which is that when I was young, I found gayness or effeminity or flamboyancy to be somewhat unattractive because I wanted like a, a street guy basically it was kind of like what was inside my mind. Mm -hmm. um, that was the fantasy. Do you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. that's something that obviously has shifted over time. I mean, now I find all manner of gay men to be to really wonderful and beautiful and attractive and all those kinds of things. And I'm not no longer chasing the sort of unattainable fantasy of, of a straight man mm -hmm. most of the time. But, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know exactly where I was going with that, but. No, no, we were just talking that you had your first uh, uh, relationship oh, yeah. at CalArts. So, so that, yeah, CalArts was, and it, yeah. I mean, first boyfriend was was uh, was in the dorms at Kellarts, and then you know, then that complicates things because you like you, know, you live near each other and all those. Yeah, yeah, but. yeah. So let's let's go back a little bit. So, what inspired you to become an actor? Uh, I mean, I think definitely my parents and that sort of a thing. I mean, having I think performing, if I'm gonna kind of get down to the absolute sort of lowest factor here, I would say it's that performing or creating art is transportive, is um, so fulfilling on so many levels. Um, and acting happened to be one of the things that I feel like I demonstrated a certain amount of skill at. So like, I mean, if there are things that, the things that bring me joy is, is flow, is like flow state, you know what I mean? Whether it's, mm -hmm. it's acting or whether it's singing, playing the guitar, writing, I'll get a sense of it, dancing, things like that. If you, if I feel like I, I almost can surrender to something and let it, let it be, let it take over, almost possess, almost like a possession or something, almost like a, like a, you know, a Haitian Vodun or something like that. You know what I mean? That sense of complete and utter surrender and release is so blissful to me, I guess that, mm -hmm. that, you know, acting is one of the things that provided that because I at a younger age didn't have the facility to feel like a competent writer at a younger age. I didn't feel like I had maybe the body or the voice to be a singer or a dancer. So the acting was the thing that kind of came to the forefront as a skill that, that I felt like was well, that I was capable at, I suppose. Now, what was the production or role that you were like, ah, this this is this is what i want to do hmm. i think probably like the most pivotal as a young actor was in high school when my mother tended to be the director of the shows so <laughs> so uh we did um the comedy of errors which I, if you if people who are not familiar about it, it's about two sets of twins who get separated at birth and it's an, and the comedy ensues mm -hmm. and um there's um I'm, I'm trying to remember the names of the characters right now and it's antipholes i think is the name of the and there's two of them mm -hmm. and rather than trying to double cast it we decided to make it extra challenging and have me play both of these roles except for the final scene when they when they meet at the end and then we would have sort of a body double to do it so sounds stressful it was it was a lot of language it's shakespeare <laughs> so it was a lot of language a lot of keeping on top of things and you know 
there were times when I would forget to change the bandana and go on with the wrong color bandana on and then I'd come back and just be so devastated and you know not know how to how to channel that frustration back into the work or things like that but I guess just it's not even so much that I felt so compelled during the performance but that I felt so accomplished afterwards maybe and that's what that's what made me feel really good about it I guess mm -hmm. so it was like uh, the idea of completing this process that was the joy that, like you I guess and sort of what I was saying before about flow state where it's almost like I don't if something goes really well for me artistically, I don't I, I almost can't recall the moment. Do you know what I mean? Or recall yeah, yeah, the, yeah. You're immersed in the it. living of it. Excuse me. I just had a burp there. Um, <laughs> so I don't it's uh, yeah, it's it's hard to say. I don't you know, it's it's a really good question because it's not like I had a number of super compelling roles that I did throughout my acting career. In fact, even at Cal Arts, I, you know, never really had really juicy roles to, to sink my teeth into. So that's a good question. Why the hell did I want to be an actor? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I can, I can share my experience. You know, um, my father was a professional comedian and, uh, and he was a singer as well. And I got into singing um, particularly like Frank Sinatra standards and things like that, yeah. because I wanted to be closer to him, connect with him because mm -hmm. I, it, we, we didn't really connect. Like, you know, he was mm -hmm. older, you know, he didn't really, I, you know, my, my instinct told me that he really didn't want to have children <laughs> and, right. you know, and it was right. just like, you know, it was just like an aggravation to have, a, you know, a son. And so um, I wanted to, to get closer to him through singing and then through singing, it led me to acting and so on and so on. And then, mm -hmm. um, and so it was a way of trying to get his attention. And, uh, and that was, that was my process of why I went to Cal Arts. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I didn't have the, I mean, it sounds like you had a really supportive uh, network from the very beginning mm -hmm. about doing it. So they, do you think it, it, things would have been different had you not gone into acting? Um, I mean, here's the, here, so when we talk about like supportive, I wanted to be a child actor really bad. And uh -huh. my parents were like, no way. Yeah. So thank, I thank them for that, first of all. So, so yeah. they were supportive yeah. in all the right ways. I'm very yeah. thankful that I didn't end up becoming like trying to do the Hollywood thing as a child actor. Cause who knows, I'd probably be dead by now if I tried to do that. Mm. Um, but I, I mean, I, I have to say, I, I agree with you in some respects. I think that, that children often follow in their parents, parents' footsteps for a certain amount of, um, uh, intimate, intimacy, closeness, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right word right now. Um, so I think, you know, there's definitely something about that. I mean, how many things do we do, especially when we're young? purely for the sort of approval of our parents. So, yeah. you know, I think it's also, as I said before, academically, things weren't always great for me. It wasn't really until I got into college that I started getting really good grades and sort of started really feeling like I was a good writer and, and mm -hmm. good at good with words. I always just kind of did enough to get by previously, usually like a B student most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, where was I going with this? Um, well, let me ask you this. Was there ever a time yeah. that you thought about doing something else or like, or was it always like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to act? Uh, well, that, that's where I was going to go with that is that it, it seemed to me to be the natural thing to do because I was good at it or I was told I was good at it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, as far as like wanting to do other things, there were other things, you know, I, 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 I take on and discard hobbies like like tissue paper most of the time mm -hmm. so it's yeah. you know it's i i tend to to do that a lot I, I i take on hobbies and do them fervently for half a year and then suddenly they'll just kind of disappear so there are a lot of i feel like there were a lot of things like that as a child with, with like i wanted to be a costume designer i wanted to be a fashion designer or you know um there was a time when i thought oh i should be a doctor and then it was like oh you have to go to school for how long hmm, maybe not a doctor Mm -hmm. um so but 
because and I think that acting did fulfill a lot of those things for me because you know you kind of get to do all the things if you're an actor you get to play all the roles you get to you know as I've said many times in job interviews since uh, since graduating from Callards, they say, oh, you have a degree in acting. It's like, yeah, so I can act like I can do anything, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Just give so, me a character description. I'll fill the role. Right, right. So what was uh, what was your experience at CalArts? What did you think of it? Um, I would not change when and how I went to school there. Mm-hmm. That being said, there are parts, there are some times that I wish that I had gone when I was a little bit older. Oh, really? How so? I don't know that a, se- that a 17 year old possesses the emotional maturity to approach uh, an acting program like that in the right way. Mm-hmm. And that I might have gotten more out of it had I been a little older when I had gone. Again, mm-hmm. I don't regret it. It's, it like shapes who I am in so many ways. Um, but thinking about like, value for cost i guess maybe it would have been better if i'd waited a little longer that being said it probably would have been about thirty thousand dollars more expensive at the time so <laughs> well i you know i i want to say my perception of you i felt you were the most mature like of our group in, in terms of wow. uh, in many ways like i i i did not i i did not remember that you were 17 for whatever reason but mm-hmm. i felt like even even if i i do i think i still would have thought that your maturity level was much more advanced than well, me I for sure that. i well i was i was putting it out there that maybe i don't know right. so you're playing a role within acting <laughs> yes exactly that like must have been more confusing. meta and meta yeah. <laughs> well so, and i think part of that has to do with that I had a lot of expectations to uphold, you know what I mean? It's not like I was just this kid going off into a school with a bunch of instructors that I didn't know, you know, everyone, everyone, every one of my instructors knew who my parents were. Yeah. So it, there was a certain amount of, you know, maintaining or upholding that, that sort of. Did you feel pressure from that? Oh, there's always been, but it's similar to what I've been saying before. There's no, I don't have another alternative to compare mm-hmm. it to. So I don't, you know, it's, you know, every time I've ever gone to an audition, which I haven't done much of lately, mm-hmm. you know, it's always like, oh, you're Dakin son. Ooh, big shoes to fill. And <laughs> so that can be a little, you yeah. know, but at the same time, it's afforded me incredible opportunities and, you know, so I don't, yeah. 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 So, I mean, what, what was your most, um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you several questions about Calars, but what was your, your most, um, uh, exciting role that you played at Calars that you enjoyed? I mean, if we're talking about, so I think that can be kind of going to several different categories. I think the favorite show that I was a part of would probably be Marasa just because of the camaraderie and and yeah and the level of what we did as a scene showing as a class i felt was just really something else i didn't love my role in it uh Mm -hmm. because i played the herald and i split it with another actor so it was kind of like xena right yeah exactly so i felt a little like and but at the end you know i i feel like we did a really great job and i really really enjoyed that work if i was going to talk about individually I would say probably, even though I didn't really love the show, being able to, you know, perform in a semi lead as Malcolm in in Macbeth in the mod was probably as you know, as a a fourth year was probably one of the better experiences. And yeah, I felt like I got to work opposite someone, an actor who I really respect, Rendon, in many of the scenes. And I felt like we gave even if maybe the whole show wasn't as tight as it should have been, I felt like we gave a really good performance. Sorry, Josh. Sorry. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, and I felt like I got really nice um, feedback from other uh, students and from faculty as far as that performance. So that felt like that felt like a a win, I guess we could say, as part of my Callard's repertoire. I was just thinking about Mara Saad, us being in it. And I feel like Lou really put us in roles that we're trying to, um, I don't know, like uh, bring out a different side of us to some degree. Like I was thinking yeah. about Matt, like for instance, Matt played Kumir 
you know, which is he's the, so mad about it still. He's I know, so I know. And he had to sit there. <laughs> he basically had to sit there and watch the show, basically, right? Right. And occasionally go, uh -huh, excuse me, this is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And but I think what Lou was trying to do was say, settle down, Matt. You need to settle down a little but, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think in many ways to me, he was kind of saying, like, you need to step up and and lead, kind of, because I I did have a tendency, I think, to kind of fall into the background or, you know be a little bit more shy in terms of my acting choices and things like that, just being so young, so. And and Lou wanted me to be more erotic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was way off the mark on that one. <laughs> <laughs> little did you he were know. Plenty, that you I... were plenty sexualized at the time, so he was way off the mark on yeah, that one. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know what that, that, that was confusing, but. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was intense, but uh, you know, it was fun. You know, it was fun. I don't know if you knew this, but I, I literally went to a, a, a mental hospital after that. Did you really? No, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah I was uh, I was going through because I. Oh, I you that's I remember now because your play that you wrote for the New Orcs Festival was. Based yeah, I mean, it was based on right? that. And and yeah. it was. Uh, I mean, what it really was is, you know, not really dealing with the I had, I had learned the year before that I was losing my eyesight. Right. And so it was like not processing that and then, you know, denial and then like weird. Right. It was it was basically what happened was, is I I went to that um, the Henry Mail, which was down the street from CalArts, their behavioral health uh -huh. thing. And I was uh -huh. admitted there by a counselor at CalArts. And uh, because I was I, I thought my cat was trying to kill me. And um, hey, it happens. I had a cat that tried to kill me. So oh, really? Know, well, good. maybe I'm not. I'm so much alone. Continue. <laughs> we'll more about that later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that. But um, yeah, and then like I I admitted, and they said I was schizophrenic, and then mm -hmm. uh, which would they only did a 10 minute assessment. I don't know how they did that, but um, and then uh, I learned later on that I was just depressed with psychotic symptoms, but, um, sure, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Immediately after that, I, 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 so I bet it was all, it felt weird because being, being in that, you know, the idea of being in an, an, uh, an asylum and then actually going to one transitioning mm -hmm. after was a strange experience. So I can only imagine. Yeah. yeah. So what, it what was, uh, not quite the asylum I was, as you know. Sure. No, no, it's very different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you were in my uh, production of Alone with Sinatra, yeah. which was about that experience, and uh, you played the, doc the doctor, if I remember correctly, I because so, you threw yeah. pills everywhere. Yeah, I didn't have sort of like a musical number that I threw pills. Yeah, yeah, it was it was um, Pocket Full of Miracles by Frank Sinatra. That that's was the, right. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's right, yes. and then you were throwing antidepressants out and things like that. I remember yes. that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. I think at the top of like a ladder. I remember going up to like the top of a stair step ladder and throwing pills. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put your life at risk. No, no you're kind. You're good. <laughs> it was one that it had handrails. We were safe. It was oh, all good. 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 So not nearly as dangerous as or the whale. But. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's right. We were both in that, weren't we? That's right. You were in that as well. Yeah. I was the deep sea yeah. dude in the, the, you know, the deep, deep sea diving outfit that just was stood on the swing That's and right. i and i said this is this and this is it and i had a you That's know mic right. yeah That's right. yeah okay yeah i remember that now mm -hmm. were you one of the sea dogs the star boys we were called okay all right yeah wow but this yeah. may be something that i don't want to talk about <laughs> Julie, um, I, I no, hope no, you reach, is, uh, yeah, yeah. reach out respect. to Ted. All respect. We're good. We're good. <laughs> but um, so what, uh, who was your favorite professor? Like that you, you, you learn from, and it doesn't have to be one, but. I, you know, I think that I took a lot of things from everyone. I took, I think, and they were kind of at least from my experience, pretty perfectly timed for where I was at in that journey. Like, I think Craig was pretty perfect for me as to get mm -hmm. going, to get started, to challenge me a little bit, but also to kind of do it in a, in a, in a somewhat friendly way. Lou was great to kind of push me a little bit further beyond those boundaries and stretch, you know, uh, stretch me out of my comfort zone and, and try different things while also keeping it, you know, somewhat realistic. 
but I think um, I really enjoyed working with Mary Lou a lot. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, again, I'm, I'm a very linguistically driven person. So working on things like Shakespeare is going to be something that's always going to be more compelling to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I just liked, it was, fam it was, I guess, familiar because it's very, her approach was very similar to the way that my father had coached me with Shakespeare previously. And her approach to the text was similar to the way that my father had coached me as approaching text. So it felt both exciting and perhaps affirming. And that's mm -hmm. maybe why I enjoyed it as much as much. Uh, I love Mary Joan as well, but I that her approach wasn't one that 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 struck me in quite the same way, I guess. You know, it's funny. I don't I remember her and I don't like I, I feel mm -hmm. like I she only substituted. Right. Like. Yeah, but when Mary, Mary Mary Lou would go away on jobs sometimes for several weeks at a time. So she would Yeah, and then and then she would substitute time. for her, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I don't have a memory of her because I I didn't have that much contact with her, but well, I felt and you know, and this is no I'm again, I'm not making any judgments or anything like that, but I would say that where Mary Lou was definitely more sort of textually intellectually driven by the by the text. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Mary Joan was a little bit more of kind of the the feel approach to things, and that there's validity to that as well. It just wasn't one that that I guess resonated with me in the same way. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about cowboy. Okay. So how did that, that come yeah, about? Yeah. Okay. So that would that would be I would consider that to be the opus of my Keller's experience. Mm -hmm. Would be would be that. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the, how okay. that came about. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think especially through by about my third year at CalArts, I really started to realize that I was leaning more in the direction of, of um, writing, dramatic mm -hmm. writing versus feeling more empowered by dramatic writing than, than by my acting. Um, and we had the New Works Festival, which was a, a yearly festival for playwrights from all the disciplines. They didn't have to be from the theater school. And uh, I had spent the previous summer kind of thinking through this concept of a, of a, of a sort of avant-garde or experimental theater piece. And I mashed it together using a variety of short form poetry and prose that I had written and connected it with characters and was really thrilled with the outcome. I mean, essentially the, the shtick is, uh, there's um, sort of a, a the, there were four characters, subject, um, cowboy yin, cowboy yang, and the fan dancer. And they were all supposed to be sort of, I suppose if I'm gonna get, you know, uh, analytical about it, represent uh, different aspects of one's own gender and sexual identity perhaps and and how and basically it's sort of a discussion amongst them and and a coming of age story i suppose so, so what did what feedback did you get on it like from your parents they saw it right so my father didn't get to see it when it was in the new works festival the first time my mm -hmm. mother saw it she loved it my other family members were able to see it i got really positive feedback from theater school faculty as well as other you know members of the of of uh, the school, um, but really sort of the most fulfilling thing of all was that uh, after I had graduated the following year, Fran had asked me, to, me and Wit and all the other actors to come back to remount it again for uh, two productions to show incoming theater students. Uh, really? Expectations of what they want to see from their theater students, I guess. Wow, that's, that's boy, what an honor, right? Yeah, it really was. It was, I mean, that was an, a really exciting thing to do. So we went back and this time we, we did it in the coffee house theater as opposed uh -huh. to where that's I, a, that's a nice space. Was, yeah, it was, I, I really, it, it almost became more the, the real memory of it. But um, that time my father got to go see it and he was very, it was great. It, it felt, was, you know, it I was. was a little afraid because my parents are very classicist in terms of what they're not classist, classicist in terms of what their, mm -hmm. their approach to theater is. They don't, you know, they're not huge fans of real experimental theater and things like that. So, um, but I think I was able to, I think what they dislike a lot about experimental theater has to do with adaptation mm -hmm. and with taking something and changing it as opposed to if you, 
and this is kind of how I, I felt very much the same way when I was at school there, which is like, I feel like adaptation is a cheap, is a cheap way to get the audience to look at the director and not at the play. So they probably don't like Robert Wilson. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Ask them that. I'm just, I'm curious. <laughs> I, 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 I will let you. We'll have a follow up in the comment section on this yeah. one. But, <laughs> but because it was an original piece and the original piece itself is written to be one that is somewhat more abstract, I think that it was something that they could appreciate more. And, you know, and it's one of those things that, that is still referenced as, oh, you know, I'm so proud of you for that and blah, blah, blah. So that I, you know, I still keep, I, I know. You can't see, but I still keep a framed uh, picture from the first production here. Uh, Can you describe uh, it for those listening? Cowboy. Uh, it's, uh, it's a picture of uh, the, so Cowboy Yin and Cowboy Yang were both dressed like old Western cowboys. And one of them was made up to look like a black and white, like an old black and white um, image of a cowboy from an old Western. And the other one was made to look like sort of a technicolor cowboy like very bright colors like something that's done in in that early days of color where they look very orange in the skin and very pink in the shirts and things like that right so, and this picture that i showed is is one it's towards the end of the play when there's kind of a breakthrough between cowboy yin who represents more of like a, a positive masculinity and the subject having somewhat of a of an intimate encounter i guess right well, thank you for for sharing that. So, um, of course. so I, I just thought of this, so I want to kind of talk about. It. So, did you, did of your course. parents have a, any expectation to go to Juilliard, or were they happy with Cal Arts, or what? How did they respond when you got in? Um, I really wanted to apply to Juilliard, and I wouldn't say that they discouraged me, but I don't think that they were comfortable with the idea of me moving to the East Coast at seventeen years old. So of me moving to the East Coast at 17 years old. So I think the idea of CalArts was nice because I was able to go away to a conservatory, but I'd be 30 minutes away. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and the other thing, CalArts doesn't offer really, I mean, I mean, excuse me, Juilliard doesn't offer a degree. It's like a certificate, isn't it? No, it's a degree. Mm. Oh, it is. Okay. It For is, some yeah. reason, yeah, I thought it was a certificate program. program. Yeah. Some, some different ones are, there are certificate programs. I know they have a playwriting program out of Juilliard that is a certificate program. But the the acting program is an undergraduate BFA, I believe. Yeah, I I I I auditioned. I only I only auditioned for two schools. One was Juilliard, one was CalArts, and mm -hmm. I did not. I got to the second round of auditions for Juilliard, but I did not make it past that. And well, uh, I was waitlisted to CalArts, if we're being perfectly honest. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> then I I got waitlisted, and then I got the the uh, the offer. So that was nice. Yeah. Uh, so what is, what is, uh, what do you think was the most difficult part uh, about being at CalArts? Um, I guess, like I said, being, it was such an incredible environment for making friends and exploring your youth and your sexuality and your, you know, and all the things that, you know, I think it was difficult to maintain focus. I, I understand why many people ended up either, you know, leaving or, or being cut or things like that, because the world there is so exciting. Right. Sometimes you get so caught up in that world that you forget why you're there, basically. Right. Oh. Hey, you know what? I I'm, I apologize. I need to use the restroom. I, I have not done this I do before. too, because I just finished this big cup yeah, of tea. Yeah, so, so why don't we, I'm going to pause this. Well, let's take a little bathroom break. Sure. I'm going to pause right now. Here we go. You ready? Okay. Pause. Yep. So we're back. That is the first time that I've used the bathroom during a conversation in 81 episodes. So uh, <laughs> I apologize to everybody. Was that All right. something so, I said? What? I, 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 <laughs> no, I haven't. I, I, I'm just super stressed out. And uh, I think I'm having a nervous bladder thing today. So I'm just, uh, I don't know. I, or either that or my pro something's going on with my prostate. I don't know. I'm getting, you know, I'll, be, I'll be 44 in, in April. So. <laughs> All right. Well, you look great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, what happened after CalArts? 
Uh, so that's where, yeah, the story gets even more interesting. Is uh, mm. So after CalArts, I decided that I was either going to go to graduate school for theater or I was going to move to Japan. Mm -hmm. And so I applied to the University of San Diego, which has the program that, that works together with the Old Globe Theater down there. Because mm -hmm. my father had worked with them and I'd, been, I, you know, I'd gone down and done an apprenticeship the previous summer. Um, and uh, I did a really terrible audition. I know I did. I for the old globe? Yeah. Yeah. How so? What was University of why was it terrible? I just wasn't I was I was still busy with school. We were doing showcase and I didn't want to do um my showcase piece. So I tried to learn something from like long days journey and a night or something, and I just completely went up on the lines in the middle of it. And do you remember how I got in trouble and I didn't get to act with anybody for showcase? No. You don't? No. I got in I got in serious trouble, um, and they what would not. What did you do? Did you do a monologue or something? I did a monologue from the play Art, and I had Matt, I... Matt and I think Whitson or Aaron. I don't. I know Matt was one of the people that was. I, they were just there as as someone I was supposed to talk to. You know, doing the monologue. Oh, right, right, right. And right. Um, what happened was is so. I don't remember who the person, but it was some producer from Paramount or something that came to see us. And I, I was in a weird state and I remember um, I showed up late or something. And I, so I, I wasn't sure exactly what was happening. And, oh, wait, this sounds and then familiar. I don't know. Uh, you'll, you'll remember this um, as soon as I tell you, I think you will uh, maybe, or maybe I think too much of myself, but uh <laughs> <laughs> but so what happened was is uh, so i was paired with xena and i was supposed to be this boss that was trying to seduce her and okay instead right. of doing it straight i did this ridiculous like steve urkel like boss oh that's okay yeah that and everybody was yeah. so embarrassed by it um, and I, I can't remember, we had a specific teacher that was, and I don't even remember her name, but um, she was the one kind of facilitating. It was a class that was supposed to kind of be a transition from CalArts out into the real world. And it was, you know, Wasn't it was a lot about like career. The, the acting for the camera too? Was that the same no, thing? no. It was more like career management type class about like things to, you know, it was, I mean, part of it was like, you know, take care of your finances and your loans clearly and... i was checked out by that point because i remember that yeah. at all but... <laughs> yeah and and so i did that horrible um scene and i got in trouble and they would not allow me to act because it um i would they felt i was too unpredictable and not reliable so oh well come on now they tell you to like make creative choices and then get mad at you for making creative choices well i i think that's, that it wasn't appropriate appropriate for that uh that class because somebody from the outside was coming in to assess us so we should was have been at our best us, yeah, I and I, I the thing was is i just wasn't thinking and i was late and i was just like i wasn't sure i, I really didn't know what was going on i was just like right and right. uh but yeah so so let's go back to uh the old globes you so the audition that didn't go well and then what, what happened? it was terrible i tried to do it and then he was like is there anything because i'd met the guy before too when i was down there before for the previous um mm -hmm uh summer and he was like is there anything else you want to do and i was like well and so i just did a a, a short monologue that from the macbeth that i had been in and then i did my showcase piece which was the harold pinter thing i don't know if you remember it was a monologue that i did mm -hmm. but um and then he was like wow those were great you felt really connected to them and i was like yeah too bad i screwed up that first one and then, <laughs> i mean i got uh you know he reached out to me later and said Oh, we want to go older this year. We want to get people who are older into the program this year. So, I mean, whatever. No big yeah. deal. Hey, so can you get that... a little closer to the mic? I, I, I have oh, a little... yeah, of course. I'm sorry. Let me yeah. get a little closer. Is that better? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so, I also have a tendency to mumble sometimes. So, I that's apologize. all right. That's all right. I, I mean, I can hear um, you through the whole thing. It was just this, you started to fade back a little bit. A little quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, then that sort of fell apart. And, um, I decided to go on a trip to Japan to see if I would want to live there and potentially interview with some people. Can you I explain to... what the impulse was for that? 
Um, I so my uncle by marriage is Japanese, so I mm-hmm. grew up somewhat exposed to the culture. I mean, I wouldn't say like it was extreme. It was just sort of like you know. He was How about the language? Did you have any grasp of the language before you went? I if you I don't know if you remember, but like the sort of last semester that I was at Cal Arts, I always had like a little self study Japanese book that I would yeah, carry around yeah, with me yeah. and kind of try to. And then I went in the summer after I went to take a Japanese course at a at a Japanese school here in Los Angeles. And, you know, I am I am somewhat linguistically inclined, not only just I mean, let's just say like accent wise, like, you know what I mean? As an actor, I can mimic, I can do mimicry mm-hmm. really well. So I was able to somewhat, you know, mimic and authentically sa- sound pretty authentically like I was speaking Japanese. So mm-hmm. I thought I was really golden. Of course, then I got there and turned on the TV and I was like, I can't understand a damn thing that is going on. Oh, really? I don't know what the hell? Yeah, I don't speak the language even a whit. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, persistence, staying, keeping at it. And, you know, now I am actually, I have like a certification that I am, it's level two, which is not the highest level, but level Sugoi. one. Sugoi. Sugoi this ne. <laughs> <laughs> so, persistence and whatnot. But it, it really was the impetus, was, I mean, I, by the time that I had finished Cal Arts, I knew that I was more driven to be a writer than I was driven to be an actor. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but who wants to read something a 21 year old wrote? So mm-hmm. I, you know, at least that's what I thought at the time. I thought that my life experience was far too pampered and coddled. And, you know, I grew up pretty privileged and went to a nice college for acting and things like that. What, what do I have to write about? Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought getting out and getting some life experience and living in a foreign country would be a great way to do it. And, um, you know, I thought I was going to go over there and be there for a whole year. And mm-hmm. just one thing turned into another. And I ended up over two stints staying for about seven years. So it it just became so fulfilling to have something that I, particularly the language that I felt like I was able to get better and better and better at and master every single day, mm-hmm. learn new things every single day, every ride on the train, you'd be looking at another advertisement on the train and puzzling it out and then being, oh, that's what that means. And that just constant sort of intellectual stimulation everywhere I went. So that mm-hmm. became the thing that I enjoyed about it most. So um, what was it about the culture itself that like, that uh, you, you discovered as you were there? Like, was there any surprises or was there, did you feel like you had a pretty firm grasp of everything that was happening before you went? There, there are still surprises when it comes to Japanese culture with me, let's put it that way. But Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the things that resonated with me the most was, I think when we imagine Japan, we imagine it as like this kind of technologically advanced future land, particularly Tokyo, which was where I was. Mm -hmm. Um, But I realized that actually, in order to sort of maintain um, high job, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Job retention, job security and just job retention and and Mm -hmm. employment, just maintaining high employment numbers. They actually um, resist automating a lot of things, at least they did at the time that I was there. Mm -hmm. So like the office buildings were full of filing cabinets, full of papers and everything Mm -hmm. had to be filed and stamped and notarized and all these things. And that just seemed to me to be sort of backwards with what my concept of it was. But I realized that it was it was about I mean, with a population that large, you kind of have to create busy work to keep everyone employed. Yeah. So that was one of the things. I mean, I think, and I've, I've spoken to this with some of my other, with some of my clients when they've asked me about, um, you know, my hairstyling clients, when they've asked me about my history in Japan is, I, it's a very unique experience to be a Caucasian male in Japan. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I get to enjoy a certain amount of privilege being that. Mm -hmm. And so like, would I want to be like a Japanese businessman? Would I want to be a Japanese housewife? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Sort of one of the things that I enjoy about Japan is the fact that I get to enjoy a certain kind of special privilege being a a Caucasian man who speaks Japanese. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to try to pretend like that's, that that's not truth. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are a lot of things, I mean, just the social, the social contract, you know, the hierarchy. In, in a, in a, not even in a hierarchical sense, but in, in, mm-hmm. let's say, uh, in the train station, you know, mm-hmm. one side of the stairways is go up. The other side of the stairway is go down. No one's ever going up the down way. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Or um, another example would be uh, at, in all the fast food restaurants or like a Starbucks right next to the trash can, there is a drain and you're expected to empty your drink and empty your ice into the drain so as to avoid creating wet garbage. Mm -hmm. And everyone just goes along with it. And there's a yeah. certain amount of, I mean, when you're first there, there's so many things that you look around and you say, now, why don't we do that? Now, why don't we do that? And then you come to the realization it's because we don't have the social contract to people won't do it. And that's why we don't do it. Mm -hmm. People, uh, Americans like are that, far the, too opportunistic. I, if I remember, you have to take your own towel when you go to the bathroom, right? Sometimes uh, in public restrooms, they don't, they often don't provide. Yeah. They don't provide yeah. uh, like paper towels. You, you have, you, most people carry around a small, like handkerchief sized towel that mm -hmm. they can use both to dry their hands, but also it's, it's blazing hot in the summertime and you want to have something to wipe the sweat off your face. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into a a anime? Uh, after, so I worked in Japan initially as, uh, for what they call an English conversation school or in Japanese it's called a Kaiwa, which is mm. all Japanese people grow up learning English in school. Now they start learning it in elementary school where previously they started learning it only, I think in junior and high school, mm -hmm. but they learn it in a very, Japanese way. So an example mm -hmm. would be like one of the first sentences that they learn is this is a pen, but they learn it as jisu is a pen. Mm -hmm. So they don't learn the, the pronunciation, they don't learn conversationally, essentially, they learn it just in an academic way so they can pass their college entrance exams, pass the English section and get into college. Mm -hmm. So then because of the increasing need for English speakers, they've created these schools called a Kaiwa English conversation schools where they get people to come in and you sit basically with a Japanese person and you just talk to them and you have mm. like a guided lesson that maybe helps someone some, some vocabulary and things like that. So I worked for one of these schools, a school called ECC. It was good. It's a little, it's a, can be a little soul destroying at times because sometimes the people aren't there of their own choice. It's something that the company has contracted them to do. Mm -hmm. They're forced to come to these classes. So they're not exactly engaged or interested in talking to you. And you feel like you have to pull teeth to get anything out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but the same company also did kids classes and I really enjoyed teaching the kids classes. So after a couple of years there, I actually ended up moving into working as a full-time kindergarten teacher in a really upscale private kindergarten in Western Tokyo where I taught English and music or English through music, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just, the whole time plowing away at my Japanese studies, going to a Japanese school, taking this, the JLPT, the Nihongo no Ryokushiken, which is like the Japanese proficiency test. Um, and then eventually a friend of mine who was living there, another American guy, he had gone through a translation program at a special school and he had, connections to these jobs. And so I ended up getting some freelance uh, translating jobs doing rather obscure anime. I mean, one of it, one of them was like an erotic horror. The other one was like a, a women's sort of, you know, romantic fantasy anime, things like that. But still the experience was there. So. So, um, so what happened now where you, you were there during Fukushima? Yes, I was. Yeah. So what was that experience like? So that was the third major earthquake of my lifetime, <laughs> being that I grew up in the Bay Area. So I was. So you went through the 88 Loma Prieta? I was in that one. Yeah, we lived on the Stanford campus when that one came through. And then in, what was it, 94? The one here in Los Angeles. So are you the oh. cause of all these earthquakes? This, so, that... yeah, <laughs> that's what. So actually, like a week before the Fukushima earthquake, um, I was telling one of the other Japanese coworkers who I worked with, I was working at a junior high school at the time as an assistant language teacher. I was telling him about how I'd been in two major earthquakes and I joked about how I was the sort of cause of this. And then after the one that happened in Fukushima, when we were all meeting in the middle of the, he was like, it's your fault. It's your fault. I mean, he was, you know, joking, <laughs> but, uh, but it, but it was weren't. the third major earthquake of my mm. lifetime, but un without question, the absolutely most terrifying of them all. Yeah. I, where were I you? Was, were I, you in Tokyo? I was actually, I, so I lived in Tokyo, but I worked uh, about an hour and a half north of Tokyo, so closer to the epicenter in uh, Saitama Prefecture. Mm -hmm. um, so I was on the fifth floor in a junior high school classroom. Mm -hmm. And I usually, I'm usually being the one who's been in so many earthquakes, I'm usually the one who sort of senses them coming first. 
Uh, but one of the students was like, oh, the, the clock is shaking. It must be an earthquake. Mm -hmm. And I turned around, the clock was shaking. And then all of a sudden, you know, the rumble started to come. Mm -hmm. So just for reference, I think the Loma Prieta was like 35 seconds. And I think the Los Angeles quake was somewhere around there too, like 30, 35 seconds or something like that. The Tohoku earthquake was like longer than three minutes. Oh, Jesus. So did it, you think that I, this is it? Life is ending. There was a, there was a moment where I was under the desk looking at the, looking at the floor, the dusty classroom floor and thinking to myself, this, this might be the end so right. do you know what I mean? which is a very chilling thing to think yeah but also the, the strangest things occur to you in that because like i was under the desk there was a girl uh, i was at the front of the classroom so there was a girl right in front of me and she was crying and i reached out and i grabbed her hand and i told her in japanese you know it'll be okay and then i'm thinking to myself is it gonna be okay and then one of the kids says the clock is gonna fall the clock is gonna fall and so I got out from under the desk, pulled a chair up against the wall, got up all of this during this earthquake, got up on the chair, got the clock off the wall, put it under the, put it on the desk, got back under the desk and then thought to myself, what the hell did I do that for? So what if the clock fell? Yeah. <laughs> but in that, in those kinds of moments, you kind of have, you know, I, I feel like you're like, I, I need the time. Didn't this. Have, I didn't have control of my, <laughs> of, of what it's just that such a traumatic event. I didn't, you know, so yeah. that was just the beginning and then that earthquake subsided and i remember you know myself and the other and the japanese teacher were looking at each other like wow that was really big and then the pa came on and they were like oh we just had a relatively large earthquake we're going to continue classes as normally scheduled and so the there wasn't any damage other, where you were like, at what the hell <laughs> and then a huge aftershock hit right afterwards and so then they said all right everybody everybody out onto the onto the playground or into the center courtyard i guess mm -hmm. So there wasn't and, much damage uh, where you were at. No, I mean, like if you if you've ever seen pictures of of sort of metropolitan areas in Japan, power lines are everywhere. There are power lines everywhere in Japan. Mm -hmm. And when after the earthquake, I remember I went and I pulled open the sliding window in the hallway and it was just power lines whipping everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was but I couldn't see any damage. There wasn't really any smoke or anything like that. But we knew, you know, that it was a sizable enough quake. Japan is very their infrastructure is very well prepared for earthquakes. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I remember you know, watching a History Channel thing about how they have like these uh, basically springs underneath buildings and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. things like that. They're yeah. very well prepared for it because it's a very, you know, there's a lot of seismic activity there. So, yeah, um, but obviously there was going to be problems. I was stranded away from I couldn't ride the train back home. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the news all started to come in about the tsunami and all those kinds of things. And then that was just, you know, very somber. And luckily I was able to find uh, another teacher from the school who was able to put me up for the night before I could get back home. But it was- How long you know, was it before you got back home? The next day. I mean, I okay. woke up the night, the trains were stopped. The next day I got up and I walked back to the train station because I was like, I'm going to see if the trains are running. And uh, they were not, but I, I really wanted to get home. And so I actually just started walking under the train tracks and I, I mean, I was not close there. I would not be able to walk home, but I was just, I just didn't want to. So I started walking. I probably walked for about six miles before then I heard the trains running on the stations above because mm -hmm. it was like an elevated train track. And so then I walked to the next station, went up and was able to get on the most crowded train I have ever been on in my entire life. Like literally had trouble breathing because so many people were on that train. Yeah. Um, because everybody wanted to get home, I guess. So, um, but yeah, it was, you know, it was pretty traumatic. And then as the news out of the Fukushima power plant kept coming, you know, I, I sort of said to myself, well, if there's one more explosion, maybe I'll think about going home. And then there were about five more explosions. So I thought, okay. Wow. That's intense. That's yeah, it was. Yeah. It's it, sometimes it's, I forget that that even happened, but there it is. Yeah. So how long did you stay there before you went back home? Uh, I was there for about a week after the earthquake. And then I came back sort of tentatively for about three weeks because the, the company that I worked for, they were like, you can take as much time as you need. You know, you decide what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually I remember I, I went to the to the vice principal of the school. And I said, yeah, you know, they said, uh, the company said that we can leave if we want to. And he was like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. He was like, oh, now. And I was like, yes, now, yes, I'm leaving now. <laughs> so I went, I came back to the States and sort of was here for about three weeks trying to figure out what to do. 
and decided that I was going to come back. So went back to Japan to close out all my accounts, you know, sell all my furniture, get rid of everything and, and, you know, settle up, um, which was the most stressful four days of my entire life trying to get that taken care of. So what, what were you thinking you're going to do? What were you like, well, I'll go back and do translation or what were you? Uh, that was one of the things, I mean, translation has always been something that I do still take on freelance here and there every once in a while, but being, I'm, I'm very picky about the work I take because coming from an entertainment background and my strengths in Japanese life in conversation and in dialogue, mm -hmm. I like to do entertainment translation. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the work is like medical documents, legal documents, things like that. And while given some time to learn the jargon and effort to do so, I'm sure I could do it. Mm -hmm. It's just not really what I want to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I definitely thought about doing some translation opp opportunities like that, but I ended up just uh, moving to Austin, which is where my brother and his wife were living at the time. What was that move for? Just because they had a they had a house that I could stay in and mm. get situated. And I mean, a lot of this is tied up with I've kind of been avoiding talking about my ex of nine years who was involved in some of this. Mm. So, but uh, that's some of it involved that he he did not. I wanted to come back to California. He did not want to come back to California. I see. And so. Mm -hmm. And so that was how we ended up in Texas. I see. I see. So what, what were you planning to do from there? These are all very good questions. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that was one of the things where I didn't, one of the sort of disappointing things was I expected that my experience living overseas in Japan would be something that would be more highly valued by American employers. And mm -hmm. it just really wasn't. Nobody mm -hmm. cared. Um, so I ended up, the first time I came back before going back again, I ended up working for Apple retail for almost five years and then had somewhat of an unceremonious end with them. Um, so while I was in Japan, I, I followed up with them in terms of HR and why I felt like I was uh, unfairly terminated. We'll get to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. And was, you know, and was given the opportunity basically to, to, for rehire. So when I moved to Austin, I reapplied to, to work at Apple Retail and I worked okay. for them. Just stay on mic a little bit. You're getting a little far oh, away. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I ended up working for Apple Retail again for a number of years, just continually chasing this bogus, bogus carrot of promotion. Always promised that I would be promoted to a manager and never, never getting it. So you weren't thinking of going back and were you thinking about doing theater at all at, at any point or? Perhaps, you know, it's one of those things I didn't know, I didn't know what I wanted. And I was and again, and, and I'm not trying to, to lay blame at my ex's feet or anything like that. But when you're in a relationship, you know, sometimes you you defer a lot of your decisions to the other person's happiness. And so I, I see feel like yeah. I, I sort of, you know, was trying to make life better for the both of us as opposed to for myself and in doing so sacrificed op options for myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when did hairstyling come into the play? That was about eight years ago, I guess. I was still living in Austin. Mm -hmm. I got tired of chasing that bogus character promotion from Apple. And I decided that, you know, when we were in theater, we did uh, theatrical makeup. And also when I'd done crew, costume crew for some of the shows, I had an opportunity to play around with some wig dressing and things like that. And I thought it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like, social creative something that was a portable skill that i could do anywhere uh, i could work behind a chair i could work uh you know as a session stylist on photo shoots or, or even possibly film and television so i went to beauty school and i was really adamant about i really liked the vidal Sassoon approach which i'm not going to bore everyone with it but so I now I, I i gotta say matthew Dittman, our mutual friend must have went off on the fact that you worked at, he has a he always has talked about he was always talking about Vidal Sassoon. So yeah, did, did he we mention anything? Good. We don't look good. No, I never really did. I mean, it was, I actually ended up working for the salon as well in New York city when I moved out there. Um, now I want to uh, say I could see, I mean, if, when you started, I remember you were posting photos on Facebook and I could see better than I can't see anymore, but sure. Um, but you, you're, you're, you're amazing. You're really a talented oh, thank uh, you. That's, hairstylist. That's yeah. That's, Hairstyling is 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 a is a career that I think that you have to be prepared to deal with a lot of imposter syndrome. It's you know, e even after doing it for seven eight years, I still feel sometimes like I'm just not good enough or things like that. Really, but 
I mean, it, it's, it, I think it's just part and parcel of the industry. I, I think a lot of people feel that way. And, you know, we all have good days and bad days, but I, I, it seems to me that on the whole, my clients are pretty satisfied with the work I do. So <laughs> now was there any inclination at any point early on or did you, did, well, how did, how did you get the idea for it? I always sort of liked, you know, cosmetics and the, and sort of the beauty industry, I guess. I mean, it's, it's ironic because I was already fully bald by the time I became a hairstylist. It wasn't like I, I had my own hair to play around with. Mm -hmm. I think I was in a lot of ways inspired by my brother's wife, who, who is a great inspiration to me. Her name's Katie. And, you know, she was talking about sometimes, you know, working because she's a, they, she works in film and television. Mm-hmm and video production. And she says, sometimes you just kind of want to say, fuck it and just become a hairstylist and live your life. And I thought that sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. So I think she was sort of an inspiration to that. And it's, you know, it, some people get into hair because they are extremely passionate about hair. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of those people. I like it. I like doing it. I think it's a really, really fun job. I get very um, fulfilled by the work that I do, but it is, it's my job and my well, passion is more. I'm sorry, ahead, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, not at all. No, I was just going to say, you know, uh, you're also a therapist, really. Well, you can be, yeah. But sometimes you can't, people you can't give the advice you want to give, unfortunately. Yeah. You're looking for a tip at the end of it. So. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I mean, <laughs> essentially, people really vent a lot when they're in that chair. Oh, they do. Yeah. I mean, I one thing hurts. I can tell you, especially having gone back to working behind the chair through the second half of the pandemic is... I am so tired of talking about COVID and I am so tired of talking about vaccines. Right. So, <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it, that must have been odd, like having, I'm sure you've had, you know, conflicting uh, uh, conversations with people. You're like, oh, uh, right. Well, and being here in LA, which is one of the stricter places, you know, eventually then we, we did have to enact a vaccine mandate and things like that and have mm -hmm. to ask people for proof of vaccination. And, you know, that just gets people real angry sometimes. So. Yeah. Yeah. I live in a place that's very divided. So it's like, uh, it's a very odd place to be, um, mm -hmm. in terms of that. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I want to talk about your, um, your website and your writing you so you're writing kind yeah. of a uh a, 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 like a horror mystery type um, yeah it's, book, um, right i have yeah i've written another i guess about 10 years ago i f i finished another short novel that i had written while i was living in japan that's um it's sort of uh it's like a gay coming of age story in high school sort of but rather dark and and, mm -hmm. and gritty um, and then I wanted to work on something else. So actually this one began, I don't know if you're aware, but I had about three years ago, I had a pretty terrible skiing accident. No, um, no, no, yeah. no. I didn't hear about this at all. Nobody told me. Yeah. So, uh, after I separated from my ex, I was trying to live my best life and I've always loved skiing. I was still living in the, on the East coast. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started, I got all my own equipment and I started basically going up to upstate New York almost every week to go. Oh, wait a minute. I think it's coming back now. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I went up one, I called in sick to work to go skiing first mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And then I got up to the mountain and it's just, I'm not, I grew up skiing in Lake Tahoe and on, on the West coast where it's just all this powdery snow everywhere. And yeah. I, in, on the East coast, it's ice. And, and basically I had a really bad fall where I fell straight legged uh, in my ski caught in the snow. And so, and I was going probably about 35 miles per hour for being honest. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, my femur, you know, the large bone of my thigh impacted the tibial plateau. So the top part of the tibia and fibula and impacted that so hard that it shattered it into. Like, oh, like, Jesus. So I had to have, they, I still have a bunch of hardware in my leg and I had to have it all sort of reconstructed. And I wasn't able to put any weight on my leg for like 16 weeks and then start to build it back slowly from there. So you probably had a co compound fracture, like, like it was did... like, I mean, it was basically like, you know how like the top of the tibia looks like a classic kind of um, like a bone, like, like a dog chewing on a bone. Yeah. Yeah. It's like one of those knobs was completely obliterated, it was completely shattered into. Do, tiny do you remember, like, did you remember, like, 
do we, did you pass out immediately or did? No, no, no. I remember the accident. I remember, and I remember like people skiing over and saying, are you okay? Are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. fine. I'm fine. And then trying to move my leg and being like, actually, can someone <laughs> come help me, please? Can someone call the ski patrol? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but even then, still, I was convinced that oh, I've just got a dislocated knee, you know, and the medic yeah. at the ski resort was like, a dislocated knee is extremely uncommon and unlikely. And yeah, and so eventually I did, you know, I got the diagnosis. And so I, you know, I ended up being stuck in a wheelchair and in a in an easy chair for, you know, several months. I'm and sorry. Was, no, but that was what started me writing the project that you're discussing right now. So I mean, I had little else to do. And you can see since my leg is healed, I haven't done nearly as much writing as I should have done. <laughs> <laughs> so how, I mean, how are you walking now? Are you, uh, is it, is there a lot still, of pain when it gets know, cold? I'm, it's, it's, it's still, I, to say that there's, that it's a hundred percent better would be, would be a total lie. I mean, it's, mm. I still feel stiffness, especially if I've sit for a long period of time and I get up, it's stiff, it's painful. Mm. I don't feel terribly comfortable running. I can walk pretty much anywhere. Running makes me feel a little uncomfortable just because of the, the jarring movement of it. Yeah. Um, my, my, I've always been very flexible in my knees. Like my, I always had what you call hyperextended knees, which means like if I bend them backwards, they can bend a little bit backwards. Yeah. So my uninjured leg can't do that or my uninjured leg can do that, but my injured leg now cannot. So one is like stiffer and doesn't quite unbend all the way and things like that. Right. But I'm up and walking. I work a job where I work on my feet, you know, up to 12 hours a day. So, I mean, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I, the wonders of modern medicine, shall we say. So let's talk about what you're writing. So to, uh, mm -hmm. it, describe the theme and, and what, what you're trying to convey. It actually came to me initially as I think I was watching probably very high on Percocet or something from my surgery. I was watching some sort of true crime documentary or something mm -hmm. on on lifetime or i don't remember what it was and it the sort of gist of it was that someone had been buried under the floorboards of the of the cellar of the home mm -hmm. and i and i just kind of started thinking i used that as an impetus to start kind of brainstorming and writing and i thought you know like what if a, what if a body sort of could begin to regain a certain sense of consciousness and recognize that it was a body buried in the earth but knew nothing else about itself and had to kind of puzzle its way, find it, puzzle its way into understanding how they came to be where they are and why they are there. Mm -hmm. basically. That sounds scary. Um, right, right. <laughs> so I sort of started off with the idea of like, you know, this of what what uh, kind of a, a new notion of the idea of a haunting that the haunting is not to terrify or to scare off anyone. But in fact, the haunting is there because the 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 spirits are are trying to reach out to you because they're they're just desperately trying to figure out what how they came to be spirits basically mm -hmm. um so sim simultaneously at the same time it, the there's a young girl it takes place in like the early 80s and there's a young girl who moves into a house um in upstate new york the house that the mm -hmm. body is in the floorboards under the floorboards um and she sort of serves as a bit of the catalyst for this spirit's reawakening. Um, her her backstory is also covered in it. So it, it sort of jumps back and forth between his memories. It's a, it's a man who's buried in the cellar. His memories of his life in the 50s and her living in the 80s and mm -hmm. sort of discovering that. And her backstory is one where she inspired actually a lot by john sanders and when i went to visit his family in kentucky it's uh mm. she grew up in like an, an old sort of plantation house in kentucky and had all these imaginary friends which then you sort of come to realize are you know are perhaps spirits and that perhaps she's a medium and, and that she's in, sort of interacting with him and so it's for those it's listening and watching john sanders is somebody who went to cal arts with he's a fellow yes, actor yes 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 yeah. yes and he, we, he, his parents, when we were in school there had, they lived in um, a historical monument. It was a really beautiful old plantation home in Kentucky that had, you know, the wraparound porches and the white columns and all that business. So I had the opportunity to go out and visit him there and this, and it served as an inspiration for this location in, in my story. Did you have a mint julep? Well, I, we didn't have a mint julep, but sweet tea. I mean, we might have. You never know. We had sweet tea. That we definitely had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there were slaves' quarters. So yeah. you know it was legit. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. pretty wild. Um, 
but it was uh so it's about it's kind of a dual story it's about his realization and the piecing back together of his past and how he came to be where he is and also her sort of coming into her power her mediumship i guess which is not at all what i intended when i first started writing the story but you know as i was saying before it's like flow state and when i'm writing something sometimes it's like i might sit down to sit to to say okay here's i'm at point d now and i'm going to get to point e and i'm going to get there by doing this this and this and then i start writing and it's like well that's not what i thought was going to happen here we go (laughs) we're just going to follow along but that's kind of the gist of it and i'm i would say i'm about three quarters of the way through i've got maybe another 50 to 100 pages before i feel like it's completed but wow I know where it's gonna go i know it's gonna happen that's great well i yeah i read a little bit it's awesome man um and um yeah, yeah. so if, if everybody listening and watching if you're you're interested in like to read it go to ehmatthews.com that's e is an echo h is in hotel matthews.com correct that's right and that'll lead you to the to the, like the main page there's some other sort of random scattered poetry on there but this piece itself is called graveyard dirt is what the the Mm. name of this is right wow that's that's wonderful so thank you um thank you for featuring him yeah 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 i'm 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 so happy that you're you're still writing and uh creating and uh and so on so let me let's let's go back just a little bit so what is the weirdest memory of me at cal arts that you can think the of weirdest memory of you. I mean, it's not even that weird, but I think once it was one of the times that I like I had my brother and sister come to visit me. Maybe we were going to go to an art opening or something, and mm-hmm. I was showing through the through the hallways, and you came around a corner and you laid a big wet kiss on me <laughs> before you kept walking off. You were like Ted or Ted because at the time I went by Ted. I, I right I still wanted to sort of be masculine and, and was right a bit disillusioned by that meanwhile I grew my entire life all my closest friends and family all called me Teddy I just insisted on being called Ted right but you came around the corner and you gave me a big hug and a huge kiss on the mouth and then just kept walking off and it was kind of like oh he's in my class you know to my, to my brother and sister <laughs> that sounds like me <laughs> yeah not un, not unwelcome but you know it was it was a surprise you know what um my memory of you and I and and it's interesting because we both have a mutual love for our friend Matthew Dittman and and what I loved it was hearing you laugh when he would you know make a joke or play a a weird character Uh Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh and I your your laughter was was just beautiful and I just I always I remember that to this day and you know also very talented and uh and um charismatic and um so it was uh yeah and i i just think of it did you remember when matt did his his doc worker meat hooks and pornography you remember that <laughs> yeah, yeah so do you remember i mean, i i, I had a conversation honestly we go ahead, go ahead that... no you got I was going to say, if the three of us got together again, you'd, you'd hear that same. Cause whenever I hang out with him, it's just still, he's just making me laugh most of the time. That's I know. I know it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember I, and I, I feel bad because I didn't mention this because I did have a conversation with Claudia on the podcast and I really oh, wanted, no, Oh, I didn't see that one. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to mention because so Matthew did, you know, meat hooks and pornography, you know, he did that whole mm-hmm. thing. And I remember, I felt like I was the only one laughing. Like I was just, I could not stop, or at least I could not stop laughing. And I remember right. Claudia looking at me like I was insane. Like, what, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and I wanted to ask if she remembered that. But do you remember that? Was it, it was in like, we had to do like a, it was a vocal exercise in class or? Yeah, we had to choose a character uh, or somebody that we met. And, uh, okay. and I, I, I think part of it, he, he explains that he didn't really prepare. He just made up this character. Right. Right. And so, um, anyway, and so, but I, I just could not stop laughing at that character. And I just remember Claudia just looking at me like I, I needed to go and get mental health treatment. Like, <laughs> well, sometimes the thing Matthew says, I think maybe he needs to go get mental health, but then <laughs> laughing at it also also makes you makes you wonder if you should you, yourself get some mental health help. But right. <laughs> but I mean, he's he's hilarious. And uh, oh, God. Yeah. 
And um, if you if you have an opportunity, he has a, a recent experience about going to Florida. So talk to him about it. Um, oh, we we've had we've oh, you already talked to him about it. Already, yes. Not okay. not all of it, but some of it. It's and it's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I told him he has to do stand up with that. Uh, that's hilarious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know he's I mean, so he, he certainly makes me laugh. So I'm sure he could get and, and he has before gotten an entire room of people laughing. So. Yeah. 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 So. Um, is there anything that we have not discussed that you would like to to share before we close up? Um, I don't, you know, I, I would love to just share, you know, my admiration for you. I think it's, it's, it's really amazing where you are and what you've done. And I can't imagine the kinds of experiences that you've had and, and the kind of. Are you talking about my career in the porn industry? <laughs> I'm well, I mean, that's pretty impressive as well. But I just mean, I just mean your life experience. I mean, right. I think a lot of people and I think you, you, you know, this yourself that a lot of people would feel a lot of despair mm -hmm. in the situation that you're in. And to see someone who still sees life as such a positive and wonderful thing and still sees so much beauty in the world around them or see, sees quote so much beauty in the world around them i think it's really it's something to really for me to look up to i think it's it, if i had i because i don't always have that much patience or that much understanding about myself or the world around me and i think that for someone in your position it's it's so incredible to see how wonderful you are i guess well, thank you. The feeling is very mutual. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I experience a lot of despair. There is, there is, I'm, you know, no, no bullshitting. There is, there is a lot of despair sure. in this loss, mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, I'm very fortunate that, um, you know, one of the things about Matthew Dittman that I love is he, you know, we spent a lot of time together and you spent a lot of time mm -hmm. with him as well. And, um, one of the things that I love about him is being able to laugh through everything. And mm -hmm. he inspired me a lot, um, through, you know, throughout our, our life. And, um, you know, it, it, that's what got me into starting to do stand up comedy and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I mean, uh, so I, I think there, there is a lot of despair. I mean, what I'm trying to do now is basically transform the loss and despair into something a value and something mm -hmm. uh that you know helps us get through this all this this horror that we're all collectively experiencing <laughs> so <laughs> so no i know yeah it's but it's been it's been a hell of a few a hell of a four years hasn't it yeah yeah and, I, and i'm very fortunate i i have a a wife that um she inspires me as well and um and I love her very much and that, and I'm grateful that, um, that I have her, uh, I so. am too. And I, you know, I have never had the pleasure of meeting her, but I've watched a few of your episodes and I have not watched any of your stand up yet. I'm going to get around to that. Oh yeah. But, uh, and, and if you want to kind of see us interact, go to tick TikTok, the exhausting Snyders and, and will, uh, yes. check that out. And I don't know if you're on TikTok. I'm, and Matt and I have talked about this before. We're just so thrilled that, you know, that you have her in your life and that, you know, it's just, it, it brings me great joy to see where you are, I guess. Thank you. And I, and I also, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a son as well that kind of gets mm -hmm. me out of my head. Like that's the greatest yeah. thing that, you know, to watch him, 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 you know, learn and grow and, and be, yeah. and his joy. And, and that helps get me out because I, actually, I don't know if you remember this, but Lou Palter said to me, he's like, you know, you, you mind fuck yourself a lot. Oh, I remember. Yes. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. wise words sage advice yeah. yeah so well teddy i i i am deeply honored that you uh were willing to do this and and share your your life with us and um, oh, absolutely i'm i'm so thrilled to do it and i mean it's so funny because so often i look back at my own life experience as being something rather trivial or uninteresting and just kind of recount it with you it, it does give me a sense of hey I, I have done some things and i have been some places so. yeah absolutely and i'm i'm really excited um to you know i'm i'm hope i'm looking forward to the to being able to listen to this on audible uh 
Um, so everybody, if you're interested in uh, Teddy Matthews' uh, book that he's writing, go to ehmatthews.com. That's E is an echo, H is in hotel, matthews.com. And um, thank you so much for being here. And I love you, buddy. And please stay healthy and safe. I'm hoping to get to LA soon. I'm definitely going to be. Uh, I would love to catch up with you and Matt together. Just, you know, we'll just put yeah. him in a corner of the room and he can go and we can laugh and it'll be great. I'll definitely see you. In, <laughs> I'll definitely see you in August. And yes. Um, and if not, I'm hoping to see you before then. But if but definitely in August. I hope so. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad to catch up with you. And I want to see you in IRL, as they say. All right. I, I love you, buddy. Please stay healthy love and safe. Too. And now you we're going to have you our... Thank so much. Thank you. And now we're going to have our awkward ending. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Here we go. And awkwardness. <laughs>